going to introduce very briefly our, our speakers. So Ophelia, uh, you're a journalist. You've been uh, writing and exploring uh, the maker movement, the Fab Lab movement, hackerspace for, what is it, like three, four, five, five, five years already? Um, you've wrote, recently co-wrote a book in French called Fab Lab, etc., which is a beautifully, uh, a beautiful uh, book with a lot of pictures, or your pictures, about the, the Fab Lab movement and the maker movement. And you're also one of the co-founders of Open b 2 Camp, which is a um, huge gatherings of makers, hackers, tinkers who show their creations to, to people in France. Gabriela Augustini, welcome. Uh, you come from Rio de Janeiro where you uh, co-founded Olabi, which is a maker space, but is, which is also an entrepreneur's hub in Rio de Janeiro about maker movement and, and hardware. Michael, uh, welcome with us. So Michael Desmoulins, and not Michael Renault, because Michael works at, at Renault, and um, Michael is the fab manager of Renault. So he, he created and opened the internal fab lab uh, in Renault, and he also uh, gathered a network of uh, many industrial companies and large companies in France that are interested in digital fabrication and the maker movement as a way to empower innovation, creativity, culture and change in, uh, in companies. And it's called Fabenco. It's an association which was created two months ago, just, just recently. And uh, Samuel Bernier, welcome with us. Samuel is the creative director of Le Fab Shop. So what is Le Fab Shop? Le Fab Shop is a um, a company that distributes uh, digital fabrication products and solutions in France that imported uh, the maker fair, uh, the, the, these big maker fairs in, uh, in France. We, we've organized uh, two in Saint Malo and two in Paris already, am I correct? Um, and they, Le Fab Shop played a big role in uh, importing and popularizing the maker movement uh, also in, uh, in France and in Paris with, uh, with the maker fairs. So, um, the topic today is like exploring this, uh, this complementarity between the, the grassroots, uh, grassroots sorry, uh, hackerspace associative side of the maker movement and the more business innovation side. Um, and I would like maybe to, to start with, um, with one question, which is to explore maybe one specific part of the network, which, which is like a, like a subset of the maker movement, more focused on digital fabrication, which is the Fab Lab network, especially, and generally the, the maker spaces. So today we have, um, is it like 500 uh, fab labs from the, like that suppose answer to the MIT charter that are open right now in, uh, in the world. Um, it's been, uh, yeah, 10, 11 years since the, the first fab lab opened. And so Ophelia, you, uh, you, you visited a lot of fab labs to, to write your book and a lot of maker spaces. So maybe you can tell us a few words about how you observe this duality, these two sides in the, in the fab lab movement. So this market, business, innovation for, um, angle, and this more grassroots empowerment angle? Um, well, uh, I'm going to talk uh, especially about the situation in France and the fab labs in France, uh, although I, I think maybe other labs in the world can relate. Um, what happens is that at the moment, uh, the, the French MIT fab labs are really looking for uh, an economic model and uh, also a legal structure that can enable them to uh, bring together uh, these two sides. I mean, they're not uh, opposite, and they should actually work together, uh, the grassroots empowerment and uh, the business side. So at the moment, um, most, I mean, most fab labs in France, 80% of them, uh, are a non-profit organization. And this is becoming a problem because uh, they are sometimes, they have subsidies from the state. Uh, they're looking for other sources of income. And uh, they are facing, I mean, th there are a limit to what you can do with a non-profit organization in France and its competition. So what they are coming up with uh, in order to deal with uh, the grassroots parts, uh, education and sharing, and then the business is that they are creating uh, companies working alongside the non-profit. Because at one point, uh, you, have, you are making an Arduino workshop, and then you are having a business transaction with an aircraft uh, company. 
So <laughs> the tax administration is not really happy about it. And uh, truly, I mean, the, the French uh, Fab Labs were gathering last week in Toulouse, uh, and they are really worried uh, about this. This is like the big question at the moment uh, in the French network. Um, also, so what they are doing is that uh, they are pooling resources, uh, organization, uh, with companies, uh, but they are also teaming up uh, with incubators, incubators and uh, social economy companies. Uh, for what? Because uh, what, what happens with the maker and its invention? So that's my second key point. Um, it's when you are making your prototype inside the Fab Lab, what happens next? So um, the MIT charter is very, very clear about it, is that uh, what happens in the Fab Labs, if you are starting to uh, commercialize your invention, it has to be done outside the Fab Lab. And so the maker is uh, quite alone, uh, unless the founders uh, are entrepreneurs, uh, they are not helped. Uh, what are they gonna do? Unless they, all, they have already created their company when they arrive in the Fab Lab, uh, once they have a prototype, uh, what are they gonna do? So. Uh, locally, Fab Labs are teaming up with incubators or with uh, networks of entrepreneurs in France uh, to help them uh, start their, their own companies. But then the next stage, and this is a question where, uh, well, the question is open, is how, how are we going to bridge the gap? And maybe Gabriella can uh, talk about this is, uh, so you are a maker, you're going through the Fab Lab and then the incubator, and you're starting your own company, but then uh, you have the uh, industrialization phase, and you're meeting with your first company uh, to uh, produce, to manufacture uh, your prototype. And then there's a cultural gap, because some companies, not all of them, but some companies, they just don't understand what open source is, what uh, <laughs> sharing is. <laughs> and uh, the makers are pretty much alone uh, facing them. Uh, on the other side, I have to add that uh, among the Fab Labs, uh, there's also a lack of knowledge of what mass production is, and I think uh, an industrial engineering, and uh, I think maybe you can... <laughs> you know, relate to that. And I think that these two worlds have to communicate more and find solutions uh, all together to, to bridge this gap. Thank you, Ophelia. So, Gabriela, I would like to turn to you now. Um, does that situation in the French context relate to what's happening uh, in Brazil and in Latin America right now? And what's your perspective um, for like all of the maker space and all the maker spaces and Fab Labs in, in Brazil right now? Yeah, um, we are part of the Fab Lab International Network also, so we are one of the 500 spaces around the world. And we've been connected with different spaces, especially in the global south. And I think this discussion about the sustainability and the model and the business model for this kind of space is like the main discussion in all the maker movement and all the space, especially for the people who is managing space. And it's like all the hubs and platforms has these problems, like how can you open the access as much as you can? Because basically, maker movement, Fab Lab, and the maker innovation is about the democratization of the tools, it's not about the tools. Because like 3D printers, all these tools are quite old. The thing is when we have access to them and everyone can build their, their own things because we don't have more the IP and we can use it. So it's much more about democrat democratization. So if we open, make it as more open that we can is much better for the innovation and for the products and the process and the ideas that can happen. So every fab lab and every maker space faces this challenge, like how can you make it that open, but how can you make it happen if it's that open? And if you are talking about something that is so new and so uh, unique, how can you try to find someone to invest on it? So it's such a big challenge and it's like everyone is trying to discuss and find model. And definitely this model that the Fab Lab is a platform and is an um, a, a NGO or something with a social, a social side, uh, totally open, and then it comes a lot of spin-offs and the people can invest and comes a lot of business inside, something that is coming a lot. So I think it's the model that a lot of people is trying to work on. It's been really common also in Brazil. 
in our case specifically, we are really uh, involved in the social chains. So we are trying to understand how can we connect the makers and the people who has the technological skills and the entrepreneurs, especially the social entrepreneurs, so the people who can uh, build projects, projects and can understand how to implement something, because sometimes these two people are totally different and they are not the same one. And how can they connect to each other in trying to find the models that really respect um, the, the sense of the community in a really um, uh, pure way. I, I don't know is this the, the word that I should use, pure, but it's like, because sometimes we are talking about community, we are talking about collaboration, but we are end up with the models that at the end of the day is uh, trying to find a monopoly and bring the same uh, model that we had last uh, century and the same model that we have for the whole companies and it's just like change the power of the hands is not something that is, is new. So when we are talking about maker movement and decentralization of, of the tools, we are also trying to talk about how can we make a different kind of business model that's more distributed, is more equal and then can make something that is really respecting the community so the communities can can have the backs. It's really not about the intermediaries, but really like trying to to give the power for the people who is build their things. And it's such a big challenge. Like I don't have the answer for that. It's like we are really trying to build um, to connect people who is trying to work in this way and to see what's happened. And also uh, we believe that we for find this kind of solution for the world and make a more equal world for uh, like the whole planet, it's like something that we really need it. Um, we should like involve all the public policies, all the big companies, the makers, the entrepreneurs. We need everyone to look at the same point and try to work together. So I think in our perspective, at least, it's like in a lab perspective, uh, maker movement and maker space is much more like a platform to build something together. It's more to more the community and the knowledge that you put in the table than a specific tool, a specific object, or a specific company that can come. And it's nice when it comes. So, yeah, I don't know if, if I... Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Gabriela. Um, so I can see already a common thread emerging from, from wh what you both said, which is like about this, maybe th this cultural gap that exists between um, um, like players in the maker movement, people that uh, invent and create objects and products, and maybe some companies, especially related to, to open source. But however, we know that already uh, uh, companies and professionals are finding opportunities in, uh, in the maker movement and digital fabrication in many different applications. And maybe Samuel, you could tell us what you observe from the Fab Shop window, like what is the, the current landscape of, uh, of business opportunities that uh, uh, companies see in the maker movement? So uh, the Fab Shop is a pretty young company. Uh, it's only three years old. Um, at the very beginning, because I was employee number one, <laughs> Uh, we're like, okay, so uh, how do we do this? Because the, the first idea was to build a, a makerspace, a place for, uh, for people like me to create projects, uh, to share them, and maybe uh, sell them uh, one day. Um, the thing is, to create this kind of, uh, of makerspace, you need money. So before creating a makerspace, we, we had the business plan that was to, uh, to find the best technologies and to, to uh, distribute them to schools, to companies, and to help them build their own makerspace. Um, three years later, uh, we were able to build our own makerspace after building um, dozens and dozens of, uh, of fab labs and makerspace around France and uh, other French countries. And um, in another way we, we found to, to create a business model around um, the maker movement was um, to, to help companies uh, work under, uh, under projects and to kind of teach their designers uh, to become uh, makers, to go outside of what they learned at school and to be more, cur more curious and to share more uh, what they do. Um, the, there's a lot of things that La Fab Shop does that are business and a lot of things that are more on the you know, Fab Lab uh, type. We do a lot of uh, free workshops. Uh, we, half of what we do uh, that is not uh, private because we do it for, for companies, we actually um, put it on, onto the internet as tutorials on Instructables. Uh, if, if I make a weekend project, a little toy, I'll put it on, uh, on the internet for people to download it and uh, to give me feedback. One of the reasons why I do that is because uh, I know that I cannot 
put this toy on the market because it still has a lot of issues. I don't have the money to put it through all, um, you know, all the tests that uh, a toy has to go through. Um, and if, if one part is too fragile, I'll get an instant uh, blog post saying, hey, uh, the head of this robot just broke. Maybe you should make his uh, neck uh, thicker. And pretty much every single design I put onto the internet had um, like 10 alterations. Some of them made by me, some of them made by the users themselves. They just took a, oh, I like this little uh, car. I'll, I'll make it a cabriolet. Uh, oh, I, I need a limousine, so I'll just put it into mesh mixer and stretch it out. Uh, this is what people do. This is what's cool about the maker movement applied to 3D printing. But the maker movement, movement uh, in its core is much, much wider than this. Uh, this talk is called the two faces of the maker movement, but it has a hundred faces. Uh, let's say the two, it's the two, uh, the two ends of the maker movement, uh, because the, I, I see uh, full open source uh, at one side and full business at the other side. If you go to uh, the Maker Fair in San Mateo, uh, the, the mother of all Maker Fairs, which is uh, 10 years old, it's the 10th anniversary. Um, I just came back yesterday. In the same place, in the same event, you'll find Google, Facebook, you'll find Massimo Banzi eating ice cream. And then you have, uh, on the other side, someone throwing fire. You have all the team, all the people from Burning Man. And then you have all schools. You have St Stanford and the smaller school. And then you realize that the smaller school may be even better than Stanford. And, and you see everyone. You, we, we even went there with Air France. Like, what a less maker company than Air France. But every company has something to grab in this maker movement. What did Air France do during this maker fair? Paper plane competition. Awesome. Uh, you know, uh, every company should find a place in the maker movement, either by sharing what they do or just by connecting with people. Uh, most companies are too far from their custom customers. I find Air France most of the time pretty far from their customers. It was probably one of the first time they were actually talking to them and playing with them. Um, all, um, all dressed up in their suits. Um, so I think it was my first time at the original Maker Fair. I, I've participated in a, a dozen of them, uh, always as a maker, never really as something that somebody who walks around. Um, but I, I wish that the, the ones we organized in France, because uh, we, as you said, we organized uh, two in Saint-Malo, two in Paris, and uh, a lot more to come. I won't tell all the destinations, but a whole lot of Maker Fairs coming in France. Uh, I, I wish that we can grab more of these businesses and uh, artisans and uh, the, the makers that don't know yet they're makers, because makers have always existed. Uh, we just needed Del Doherty to say, you make something, you're a maker. This is the maker of movement. Let's just come, uh, come together and share what we do. And uh, if you're blowing glass, show me how you, how you do it. Can I do it too? Uh, maybe we, we could make a tutorial about it and put it onto, onto the internet and somebody else could learn from your skills. And this is all about sharing your skills. And if you want to make it a business, good. We need businesses. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, Michael, I would like to, uh, to maybe react to what uh, Samuel said and also Gabriela and, and Ophelia. Like, from the perspective of Renault, um, and in general, I would say the, the perspective of industrial companies, uh, because you're also the founder of Fabenco, which is the association of uh, uh, large companies in France interested into uh, digital fabrication and the Baker movement. So wh what is your perspective on this duality between these two sides and the, the business side and the more uh, associative side? And like, how does, wh what, what is Renault doing about that? Like, are you doing also paper cars to play with your customers or do you have uh, other things in, uh, in mind? So, first of all, I think the first reaction and the first way you think how, how interact with the maker movement is to see them like uh, just a new cluster of customers. So, personalization and just bring them things that can play with and work with. So, this is the first, I think, the first way, but maybe the less interesting one. The, the second way is to see those places and those people like uh, new trends, new way of working, and to get inspired by the way they're doing things. It's something like uh, Airbus is doing in protospace. They're trying to uh, to use the the way you know the maker movement is working, the way the Fab Lab movement is working to inspire them, change the way they're doing innovation inside the company. 
the third way, I think, is to work with the, as a partnership with all those people. Uh, it's something like Pult is doing with Artilec. They're trying to make a food printer. Explain what Pult is, because I, I don't yeah, think everybody yeah, knows maybe Pult. Yeah, Pult is a French manufacturer of uh, biscuits. Um, maybe the one of the bigger one, and they're trying to invent new way of uh, doing this with uh, the most ancient fab lab in France, named Artilec in Toulouse. Uh, we are also in Renault trying to work with uh, with uh, ici Montreuil on new project because we find people, we find competency, uh, expertise that we don't have inside Renault, and these places with which we can we are able to make new partnership. Uh, the fourth way, I think, is just to be become conscious. There is a lot of makers inside our own company. Inside Renault, there's a lot of great makers. They don't even know their makers. They don't know each other. And we, we have to make them connect to change the company, change the way we are making things inside the company. After that, the, what we're trying to do in uh, Fabenco is to connect all of this and seeing the company, the makers, as much more as a community and not only company with big walls, and work together and create like a new ecosystem where we can work very more freely with uh, all the company, with some all the new makerspace to create some common goods and maybe some industrial and, uh, and more uh, cost-productive products. Thank you, Michael. Um, so there was one, one topic that we discussed, especially earlier in, uh, in this, this, this discussion, which is like the... Um, the role of open source and how open source is understood by uh, companies that want to work with uh, makers and inventors. So, yeah, we, we all know about the story of Tesla, which is opening his patents and opening his technology of electric vehicles. And we know that there are experimentations from uh, other companies like Ford and, and others on very specific parts. Um, what, like, what do you, how do you relate with, uh, with that? Like, how, how is, um, uh, what's the philosophy and the approach of a, of a company like of not only Renault but basically all uh, large companies that would like to um, to work with uh, with open source and open hardware project like is uh, do they do they see possible business models and interest or do you do they see that as okay it's open so it's free so there is no economic value so I won't I won't work with that and also like if you could share uh, Gab Gabriela if you have a specific um, uh, specific case or examples in mind to share about what worked and what, what didn't work. Basically, it's a question to all of you. Like, do you have specific um, examples of case studies of trying to work in open source um, and make your movement on the on the business side? My first reaction is that uh, open source and open hardware is quite new and something difficult from old company, industrial company, to understand and to work with. We are used to patents and to protect ourselves a lot. So. Understanding that there's a new kind of business models and new kind of way of working with other people and seeing our product no longer, not anymore as a closed product, but product on which you can create new value and which some other people can create new value is a big gap to, to go through. But uh, I think this is something we are working on now a lot. We've been working with local motors recently. Uh, by giving access to a lot of designs of our own products. And we're doing this with a lot of uh, young uh, entrepreneurs in France based on light commercial vehicles and give access to all the, the NUMS and give them the opportunity to, to bring new type of, um, of light commercial vehicles for people who, who have specific needs that we cannot make on an industrial way. So... Um, yeah, about, uh, I was talking with uh, Gaël Langevin, who's the creator of, of, of InMove. Uh, he was actually in, uh, at Maker Faire. Um, so, so InMove, which is a... In, InMove, which is an open source robot, humanoid robot, uh, almost entirely 3D printed. Um, you can get every single file uh, and code uh, on the internet. He even made the design so you can print the parts and the smaller smaller uh, 3D printers, it's like, it's like 12 centimeters by 12 centimeters. Every part is screwed together, assembled by a kind of a giant puzzle. Uh, and his robot is very cool. And he didn't do that as a business model. He just did it because he wanted to. He's a, he's a full, like, 100% maker. Um, 
Uh, he, he's probably the most famous, uh, famous French maker. He just made the front cover of uh, Make magazine. And uh, his robot has clones all over the world. All over the world. Um, there's probably um, you know, hundreds of, uh, of InMove. Every time he goes to, to a new city, uh, he has somebody who can host him because there's a, a school or a little fab lab made a, a replica of his, uh, of his 3D model, of his, uh, of his design. Yeah. And um, yeah, right now he's at the point that uh, his project <laughs> Um, actually, is, he still ne needs to make the, the legs, but uh, it's quite uh, quite complete. And um, right now, he doesn't make uh, any money out of it, but it takes a lot of his of his time uh, over the company that he actually also runs. And um, and we're asking him like, uh, what is the percentage of um, of uh, what you did and what came from the community? But because in move is a whole community in itself. And he said, now between five and uh, and ten percent of InMove was uh, crowd made, but this five and ten percent is very important because it's something that Gael couldn't do himself. It's ideas that he didn't have, uh, maybe he wouldn't have. Uh, just that the Kinect part of it was an idea from the community. Of course, he's the one who who, who did uh, into, uh, insert it, but um, this. This five and ten percent may represent one year in his life. Uh, so, uh, but still, he faces this problem that now the the robot is taking over his life. Like we, uh, he, he's invited everywhere around the world, and now he has to create a business model around in move. So there are some parts that he may want to to patent that he doesn't want to put on the internet yet, even though they are amazingly clever. Because it's like now I have to make money out of this great robot. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of companies uh, fa face this. There's what they want they want to share. There's the, the community part, and there's the point where they um, they are afraid to 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 be seen as a trader because yeah, they yeah. they patent something. Yeah, but um, but but you don't necessarily have to patent to make a business model out of an open source project because you could first assemble and distribute uh, parts or uh, kits of the robots. You could do service. You could do platform business models. And I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I love InMove. It's an amazing project. But maybe there is a way to yeah. to develop a business model without having to patent. Um, yeah. Th yeah. No, that's a, a really important point, and I think that's the main discussion at the moment because it's like. Everyone, when they're thinking about business model, the first idea that it came is like, okay, I have to put the patent and that's it, that's the model. But if you think more and if you try to find another models, I'm sure that there are a lot of things that we can have, we can do, and we can use uh, the community as part of it. We can give back for the community. There are things that we can like improve this model. And also, when you talk about the free software, the open source software, not necessarily have to be free. You know, if you open the code and give access to the people to replicate and interact, sometimes it's enough. It's like you are giving everything. You, it doesn't mean that it's, it's, it has to be free. So the people, the communities understand the value of the things and you can charge for it. So it's like, it's much more to try to find the model. And it's, it's such a big challenge, a global challenge at the moment, but it's like, uh, definitely is, is a case that have to put a lot of effort to everyone try to find, okay, so which kind of model is more uh, connected to the way that we are making products nowadays? Because we know that this model of the patents almost failed. It's not something that is enough nowadays. And tell us, Tesla is a big example, and some of the companies are trying to do. And s even the companies that is not involved in it yet, they know that it's like, this is something that is not, it's not working anymore in the way that it used to work. So they have to find another way. It takes time, takes a lot of energy and effort. But it's definitely is a way that the maker movement can bring and the people can start to think about it. Um, so I have a last question for you all before uh, turning to the audience. And, um, which is like, um, how can we en enable like long-term healthy relationships between the market and the commons between companies and the grassroots innovators and the companies and the fab labs. Like, w do we have to put in place some kind of uh, mechanism, institutions, rules, platforms, guidelines 
Uh, maybe Ophelia, we can start with you. You, you can you can tell us about the Fab Economy project that. Uh, yeah. that's great. Just before that, just to to end on the uh, open source and uh, business, just a few examples. Uh, I met with a young company. They are making um, I don't know the name in English. It's like a, a device that enables you to cultivate uh, algae. So uh, and they're now trying to uh, scale it up and uh, to industrialize it, manufacture it. And so they are partnering with uh, already a big company uh, that already makes uh, these type of devices. And what the 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 discussion is this is uh, okay. You made it in Fab Lab, so it's open source. Uh, you're losing. Uh, you're using uh, Creative Commons licenses, but it's not going to work for us. So you have to close everything. So at the moment they're a bit stuck, <laughs> so they don't know what to do. So that's one example. Uh, another example is um, I recently met uh, other people in the Fab Lab. They are working uh, on a device uh, for bikes, and uh, they're actually uh, working on a closed model. They're inside a Fab Lab, and the Fab Manager didn't know what to do because they didn't want to document their work. And why? Because they had an, uh, a strategy, a legal strategy, uh, intellectual property strategy, uh, I should say. And uh, so they, have, uh, they already had lawyers around them, and they just advised that if they wanted to have patents uh, all over the world, uh, they couldn't work on an open model. So I don't have all the answers, but uh, I'd say that maybe lawyers could uh, actually work on it and uh, try to tell us uh, what would be best. I is it mixed models? Can we just go open source all the way? But I guess it also depends on what you want to do with your product. And last, uh, there is also um, a maker who founded a fab lab and he made a 3D printer. And what he's doing is that he's keeping his open source model and to uh, manufacture his uh, printer, he's asking the people, the, the f his first buyers, to make, uh, to, to, to manufacture the, the, the pieces and send them back to him. So in the end, uh, the people who bought the first printer, uh, they get their money back uh, and then they participate to a kind of a distributed fabrication network. So there. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so Emmanuel you who did the uh, follow up. Yeah. And, um, so you want me to go on to the next uh, Please do. question? <laughs> okay. So uh, just to get back to uh, solutions, uh, the um, MIT network uh, is just actually uh, following uh, Neil Gershenfeld's roadmap as it was presented uh, last year in Fab 10 in Barcelona, which is uh, after the uh, Fab education. I mean, distributed uh, education, distributed fabrication, there is the uh, distributed economy, so the uh, fab economy project. Uh, and it's, uh, it's going to be global, it's going to uh, work uh, within the fab lab, uh, MIT fab lab networks, but uh, everybody else is going to be uh, involved in it, companies, charities, anyone who wants to be a part of it. And uh, so there is, also, uh, there, there is a website that is up already called Fab Economy, uh, where you can you, where you can see what uh, the the projects uh, are going to be, and uh, the one uh, we're working on at, at at the moment is a uh, is a certification uh, that uh, basically says that uh, a product is made in a fab lab. So it's a made in a fab lab uh, certification, and the idea is to set up a website and to have a product, for instance, if you want to buy uh, jewelry that was made in a fab lab in Tokyo, you can print it uh, locally uh, in Paris. Uh, so uh, at the moment, that's the idea, and it's being tested, and uh, we'll see uh, where it goes. But it Thank you, Ophelia. Do you want to react? Who wants to react to, the, so to that question about like, the institutions and system we could put in place to enable collaboration between businesses and... Uh, Yes. Well, makers. W w in Brazil, at least, uh, we saw a lot of companies trying to, basically, they want to engage new audience and they want to be part of this conversation. So they come and say, okay, I want a space, I want a maker space, I want to be part of make a movement or whatever. But after a few conversations, we can see that there is a really a gap of the, the a cultural gap on the way that the people uh, is working day by day. And that makes the conversation really difficult because... Uh, 
sometimes the companies want to be part of it, the big companies especially, but it's like when it comes with the whole package that it comes with the maker movement, that's more flexible, that's more chaotic, needs need different time, needs different license, need totally different way to work day by day. They are not prepared for it, and they end up to say, oh no, I'm not prepared yet to, to be in this conversation. So that's something that, at, at least in Brazil, we are seeing a lot, you know? All the companies, is like, it's really interesting in be parts. They come straight away to say, okay, let's do it, and they want to be sponsored, they want to do whatever. And after a while, there's like, no, but we cannot talk about uh, open source, cannot talk about intellectual property, we cannot do that, we cannot do that, we have to control everything. Can you do in this way? Can you have this product on the end? Can you have it? And I was like, no, it's like, if you want to bring the community, you have to leave it open for the community, otherwise it's not gonna, it's not gonna work, you know? And a lot of people is like helping the companies in trying to, to, to make them understand how to work on it. And sometimes we can see like the places and the projects and the ideas that comes with these mentalities from the company, they end up with no one inside. And they stay like, well, but what's happened? Was it so popular that a lot of people talking about that when I'm putting something, no one's coming. Why so? Why there is no one in my Fab Lab? It's, it's because it's like, if it's few put like a Fab Lab, a makerspace or a space with this kind of idea and that brings this kind of sense, but you try to take the control and put the role rules that is, is in the totally different way, you are not gonna bring the audience that you are trying to bring. So. Basically, we need like a cultural shift and a cultural, uh, there, there is a cultural gap that we have to work on it to make this conversation and to be more close for the companies and for the government and for all the big institutions that it used to be working in a more centralized way. True, yeah. I, I've seen that a lot. <laughs> you probably did too. <laughs> um, I've seen a lot, with, a lot of companies from different field uh, even companies that define them, themselves a lot as, as makers, from the moment it, uh, it touches an, an actual product that's commercialized and that has been uh, already built, it's very complicated to do anything, anything to it. Once, one thing that I, I wish uh, one, one French company would be able to do, uh, I hope maybe by the end of this year, is to open one of their product enough that uh, somebody can hack it, you know, can uh, improve it without voiding, voiding the warranty. There's just also this same story about the warranty. Like, you cannot touch your car without voiding the, car, the warranty. Uh, am, I, am I right? Yeah, you can do, you, you can do much to your car, to your car w without voiding the warranty. Uh, I, I lived in countryside of Canada where everybody was hacking their car because they were able to. Now your car is a computer. So you really have to hack it if you want to hack it. It's very complicated. Uh, and if you manage to do it, well, you're screwed, pretty much, if you have a problem with it. And it, this is the same story with every project. If you have a screwdriver and you, uh, you want to have a, I know, a 45 hours battery on it, um, you, know, you, 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 can, you can do it, but you won't be able to bring it back to uh, the company you bought it uh, at. So would you say that the people that were doing tuning in the north of France were pioneers of the open source movements, basically? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Well, actually, the, one of the big uh, possibility with uh, all this 3D printing and laser cutting and digital manufacturing is to repair and upgrade and solve problems with actual products and uh, helping companies making their products better. But the companies, most of the companies are not ready for that because for, from the moment that uh, something is on the market under their name, um, they have the whole uh, responsibility for it. Uh, so if somebody designed, uh, let's say, a new handle for the same screwdriver I was talking about, and this handle breaks and, uh, you know, pops someone's eye, um, somehow, legally, they are responsible. If it was written Dremel on it, it's their fault. Uh, so they won't do it. Uh, they will allow a uh, fab lab or a fab shop to design it and put it on the internet as long as their logo is not on it. Um, and I, I've been giving workshops to a lot of big companies that have huge potential for that, um, mm -hmm. but the fact that they didn't build it themselves is a big problem for the moment, and we have to find an issue for that because uh, there's a whole universe of possibility yeah. out there. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, Miguel, do you want to make a short comment? Yeah, uh, I really should just react to say that uh, maybe not everything needs to have to be open. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good, very good, tricky question to find what to open, what not to open. And I think we need to talk and work with the makerspace and the maker movement to find the good balance with it. And just to conclude, I, this is what we do in Fabenco, in the association. I truly believe that we have to work more together and to, to find a way to, to be together, work together, have places like uh, Fab Lab or Makerspace inside company to understand them much more and to, to learn how to work with them. So this is what we're trying to do, and uh, I truly believe in it. So. Thank you. So I think we have the time for one or two questions from the audience. So who has a question for our speakers? Uh, yes. Okay. Can you? Uh, can you uh, one there and one there. First, second. Hi. Hi, my name is Gregoire Durant. I work for an architect sustainable architecture company in the States called Earthship Biotecture. And we are in the process of setting up a fab lab uh, for autonomous house and it, it, it'll be autonomous house oriented. And I have a question, especially for Michael. Um, how did you, did you come up with the idea of uh, setting up a fab lab within Renault or were you asked to do that? And what were the key points to seduce them to, to be allowed to do so? Uh, to, to be totally honest, we didn't ask to do it. We did it. All right. <laughs> we, we had a very great uh, chief that okay. uh, allow us to, to try something. So we, we grabbed a space, we, we used some, you know, some money we had to, to set up it. Mm -hmm. We took some, all of personal stuff inside it and we started to do workshop inside it. Okay. So as long as it's been working a lot, working very well doing workshops, it gave us the opportunity to open it to everyone, even for very personal projects. So, in fact, we, we manage it like, really, really like, uh, like uh, you know, very close to the, the spirit right to, to put inside it. So, entrepreneurship, openness, and just do it. So, but there's a lot of different examples from other companies when they ask for, for it, bring very structured plan to, to create it. So, maybe we can take some time after and kind yeah, of sure, talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank there you was all. a second question there. Hi, I'm uh, Charlotte Knips. I work in a Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Research in Germany. Um, we actually, uh, the institute also does research on, on 3D, 3D printing and laser sintering and all. And one of my colleagues also initiated a fab lab. So I can really uh, agree with that uh, cultural gap because actually between the director of the institute and the, the colleague who's active in that, in that fab lab world, they are really they are completely incompatible. Like the director said, yeah, the fab lab, we can, we can be economically successful and work for enterprise and all. And my colleague just said, yeah, I wanted to have an open citizen lab. So that's, uh, that's the cultural problem. Um, but I have another question about, um, about patents, actually. We all mostly spoke about big companies. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan, I'm not pro-patents or something, but sometimes you can deny that they also, that sometimes they actually work for protecting small, very specialized, innovative companies against big companies with a big uh, research and development uh, department. So those open source business models, is, are they really possible for every small, innovative uh, company? Or is it sort of, is there a, a gap where it doesn't, where it doesn't work? Okay, who wants to answer? Um, I can answer from my perspective in Brazil, which uh, probably is a, a lot different from US, Europe, and other countries. So in Brazil, this answer is like, it's the only way to survive if you are a small business, as it's so bureaucratic, the process, and the patent is like something that is not possible, costs a lot of money, it's really bureaucratic, it takes age, and you really need to be a big institution to have it. So it's like, it's, it's the only way to, to do something if you are a small company, if you are an entrepreneur. It's not as like, of course, there is uh, exceptions, but it's like in general sense, basically, it's the way that we have 
for make the things happen. Otherwise, we would stay just waiting and with the big companies from the other countries. So that's uh, once the people start to work in the open source movement and with the tools that they had, you know, with all this, this access that we have nowadays, we could see the country changing a lot because we could see a lot of big, big uh, small companies coming, a lot of small initiatives and all these things. So in countries like Brazil, and I'm sure that in some developing countries is the same, the reality is, is, is like that. This is why it's so important, and this is why the um, open source communities are so strong in Latin America, in this kind of, of countries. So I don't know, in US, in Europe probably it's easier, and then you, ha you have this, these two sides, but it's like in Brazil it's really difficult to, to keep it if you are a small entrepreneur. So we have the time for a very, very last short question. Yeah, there is one. Yeah, I think Mr. West first. Yeah. Like very short question yeah. and very short answer. I'm Hannu from Finland. Uh, I've seen recently uh, some small professional companies going to this direction. So I found a small company making injection molding molds for tomorrow for 1,000 euros in Finland. It's almost impossible thought. They have also 3D printers, they have many technologies, and they have history of pushing through different technologies. And I think that this is a revolution in the way that they are makers. I mean, those guys are really makers with maker history. They have business history as well, but they just think faster, that it's time for making fast, making this kind of new way. Have you seen anything like that in your countries? Well, um, to me, as you said, like mold makers are definitely makers. Uh, it's in their name. They're mold makers. As if you're, uh, if you're making cookies that are hopefully good, you're a cookie maker. You can share your recipe. You're a cookie maker. Uh, if you're making uh, uh, films uh, as a hobby and you share them with people, a trouble. You're a filmmaker. So, so, so a troublemaker. sorry. And if you're a troublemaker, uh, if you're a troublemaker, yeah, he's a troublemaker. Um, so uh, there's makers in every single country in the world. They just need to uh, no. We need to tell them that they are and that they, they can they can share their skills. I, I I would really like to see your uh, your mold maker in a maker fair uh, in Paris. I, I don't think if they have. Uh, do you have a maker fair in your uh, in your country? But what's what's really nice is that if you make a maker fair in South Africa, a maker fair in Shenzhen, or a maker fair. In India, you have different makers. You have people with different skills because they come they come from different places in the world with uh, different uh, resources. And uh, this is what's great with having so many maker fairs everyone or everywhere around the world. Is that if you go to the one in New York and the one to San Francisco, they are not sure. the same. I don't have time anymore yeah, to answer. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, we can talk about it later. I just wanted to add something about what uh, the lady said just earlier, is that it depends for your project, it depends to which level you want to take it. If you want to keep the manufacturing uh, local, you don't need a patent. And if you really want to go global, you need a patent, but it costs like 100 to 150,000 euros. It's really expensive. So open source model, distributed fabrication, uh, you know, it, it's just the data and the knowledge, you know, circulating all around the world, and then you just manufacture it locally. So it's a different kind of product, different kind of project, but you don't have to, to use patents, not all the time. Yes. Thank you all. That was uh, super interesting. I'm sorry we don't have more time to dig more into questions, but we can, uh, you can meet the speakers uh, after they leave the stage. Thank you to all of you.